This video was made for the Grade 12 English Home Language students within the South African Independent Examinations Board curriculum. This play, The Tempest, is prescribed for study in 2021, 22 and 23. In this video, I offer some background information as an introduction, a brief outline of the plot and some comments on character and theme, which will hopefully make your first reading of the play an easier one. The play was one of the last written by William Shakespeare, around about 1610, about five years before his death in 1616. It was published just over 10 years later and is classified as a romance. It is set on an island, and the main character, the protagonist, is Prospero. Let's pause a moment to consider the genre, romance. This is not a traditional love story. There are elements of comedy in the plot and writing. The settings are often unusual, otherworldly, and with these remote, strange settings, you'll find elements of magic and fantasy. The plots are often of loss and reconciliation, with bonds of friendship and family having been violated in some way by tragic circumstances. The sea plays a major role in these later plays of Shakespeare as an instrument both of separation and reconciliation through voyages, shipwrecks and banishments. There is a strong element of the supernatural in these later romantic plays. The action is frequently guided by divine intervention or miraculous events of some kind. Shakespeare is less concerned here with creating realistic plots, settings and characters than he is to draw upon the material of folk legend and fairy tale in order to dramatize the recurring themes of human life with a grand simplicity of myth. It would be a mistake to dismiss The Tempest as a lightweight, almost comic finale to Shakespeare's writing career. There are comic elements in this romantic play, ones that we should recognise from his earlier works. There is the banished Duke, who is to be restored to his rightful throne. The young courtly lovers and the convention of love at first sight. The princess disguised as a shepherd boy or rustic maiden and the virtuous shepherd. Shakespeare draws on these comic conventions when comparing and contrasting the ideals of rustic simplicity and courtly sophistication. These romances, such as The Tempest, impose a happy ending on a plot that could have ended in tragedy. The message is that evil and suffering are present in this world, but ultimately these and other threats can be overcome. No reading of The Tempest can do it justice. Shakespeare's tale of Prospero's Island is inherently theatrical unfolding in a series of spectacles that involve exotic, superhuman and sometimes invisible characters that the audience can see, but other characters cannot. The play was composed by Shakespeare as a multi-sensory theatre experience, with sound, especially music, used to complement the sights of the play, and all of it interwoven by the author with lyrical textual passages that overflow with exotic images and sounds.
the theatre in Shakespeare's day would have looked like this. I'm fortunate in that I've been able to watch performances at the New Globe Theatre in London with my family, which is where I took the following photographs. This shows the outside of the New Globe Theatre, and this the inside. This is how you are supposed to watch Shakespeare, out in the open with a crowd of enthusiastic audience members who are encouraged to participate in the action on the stage. I am convinced that Shakespeare would be horrified at how we dissect his plays line by line in the classroom and then make you write exams on it. To get started, we are going to have a quick look at the storyline. Obviously, as you become familiar with the text and the complexities of the plot, this information will become redundant. The play opens on board a ship caught in a raging storm, the Tempest of the title. On board this ship are the King of Naples and his son, as well as other members of the royal court. On a nearby island, the shipwreck is watched by a horrified Miranda. She has lived with her father Prospero on the island for so many years that she does not know any other human beings. Prospero tells her that he has summoned the storm on purpose and that none of the passengers on the ship will be harmed. While we, the audience, know that everyone has survived the shipwreck, the characters themselves don't know this. The King of Naples assumes that his son, Ferdinand, is dead, and Ferdinand assumes that his father, the King, is dead. Prospero subjects the survivors of the shipwreck to various torments with the help of his spirit assistant, Ariel. We learn that years ago, Prospero had been the Duke of Milan, but had become so involved in his studies of wizardry and magic that he had asked his brother Antonio to take over his duties for him. In true Shakespearean fashion, the power went to Antonio's head and he betrayed his brother and had Prospero banished. Prospero fled Milan with his young daughter, Miranda. He was assisted by the loyal Gonzalo, who saved his many books and provided Prospero and Miranda with enough food and clothing to ensure survival. The tempest, the storm, summoned by Prospero is an act of revenge, but it leads to reconciliation between the strife-torn parties. Here's a more detailed summary. Close to a Mediterranean island, a storm overcomes the ship that carries King Alonso of Naples, his son Ferdinand, his brother Sebastian, their friend Antonio, the Duke of Milan, and various members of the court. On the shore of the island, Prospero, the former Duke of Milan, watches the storm with his 15-year-old daughter Miranda. As they watch events develop, Prospero tells Miranda their story. Prospero explains that 12 years ago, his brother Antonio removed him from power. Antonio claimed Prospero's rightful dukedom for himself, forcing Prospero to leave. Prospero escaped in a boat with only the infant Miranda and his books of magic. They came to the island and made it their home and made the only native inhabitant, Caliban, their slave. Their only other companion is Ariel, a sprite that Prospero rescued and enslaved. Prospero reveals that he has arranged the storm and shipwreck so he can get revenge on those who deprived him of his dukedom. The court members come to shore all right, 
but King Alonso is extremely upset, believing his son Ferdinand drowned when the ship was destroyed. In fact, however, Prince Ferdinand has landed elsewhere and is quite fine. Ferdinand meets Miranda and they fall immediately in love with each other. Prospero decides to test the possible future husband of his daughter and captures Ferdinand, putting him to work carrying wood for his fire. At Prospero's request, Ariel uses magic to lure the courtiers away while Antonio and Sebastian plan to kill King Alonso. Their plan is stopped, however, by Ariel, who leads them all onwards, seeking food and help. Meanwhile, the court fool, Trinculo, has come to shore and discovered Caliban, with whom he hides under a big coat until the storm has passed. The two are found by the ship's butler, Stefano, who, a bit tipsy, wonders if they are a two-headed monster. Together, they all get drunker and set off to find Prospero, deciding to kill him and make Stefano lord of the island. Ariel reports their plan to Prospero. Prospero has decided that Ferdinand has passed his test and celebrates his engagement to Miranda by holding a mask that is a dance in which the guests are all traditionally masked, attended by spirits and goddesses. However, halfway through, he remembers Caliban's plot. Finally, Prospero asks Ariel to bring all the shipwrecked people together before him, but instead of acting out his revenge, he decides to forgive them, claiming that he has been moved by Ariel's statement that even he, a spirit, feels for the humans. He accepts the return of his dukedom from Antonio, and Ferdinand and Miranda are formally betrothed. Ariel is set free, and Caliban and the drunken sailors get a stern rebuke. The play ends with almost everyone celebrating their reunion. In 2018, the play was performed as part of the Stratford Festival with a female Prospero in the lead. This comic summary is a delightful rendition of that version of the play. Here in frame one, we have Alonso, the King of Naples, on board a ship saying, oh, this is a great voyage. The only thing that could ruin it would be if a sorceress wrecked our ship on her island to take revenge for past wrongs. And in frame two, we have the female version of Prospero, Prospera, saying, hold my beer. Prospera approaches Ariel, a spirit who lives on the island, saying, Ariel, I want you to go mess with the shipwreck survivors. To which Ariel replies, oh boy, I can do that. In frame four, the chaos is unleashed on the unsuspecting crew and passengers of the ship. After enduring the torment brought about by Prospera, the characters are united and everyone gets to live happily ever after. In the second part of the play, there is much discussion about the nature of colonialism, language, oppressors, and the rule of law. This might give you an inkling as to why this play has been selected for study by your examinations board. It's far more than just a story about a shipwreck on an island. These frames on this slide allude to this second, more complex part of the plot. In the first frame, you have Prospera addressing the servant Caliban, 
whom Prospera taught how to speak. In the second frame, we see the blessing of the union between Ferdinand, one of the shipwreck survivors, who has fallen in love with Miranda. In the third frame, we see the setting of a banquet. It is at the banquet that Prospera reveals his true self to the King of Naples and his false brother. Antonio expresses remorse and asks Prospero for forgiveness, as does the King of Naples. Prospero renounces magic, leaves the island to take possession of his dukedom and witness the happy marriage of his daughter to Prince Ferdinand. The plot summary might sound confusing right now, but as you work your way through the play, the various plot lines will become clearer to you. It's important to remember that Shakespeare used the five act structure for his plays. You should already be familiar with this diagram, Freitag's Pyramid, outlining the different elements of each act. In Act 1, we have the exposition, where the characters and conflict are introduced. In Act 2, the plot thickens as the protagonist realizes what he must overcome in order to achieve his goals. In the third act, we have the climax of the play. Here, the protagonist usually has to make a decision which will set in motion a chain of events leading to the final outcome. In the romances of Shakespeare, this means a positive outcome. In the fourth act, it might appear that the antagonist has the upper hand. Loose ends are tied up and complications start to unravel. In the final act, the conflict is resolved and in the romances, we get our they lived happily ever after ending. Not only must you keep track of the different plot lines, it's important that you keep track of the various characters and that you compile your own notes about each one of them as you read through the text of the play. This will certainly help you to master the intricacies of the plot. Our protagonist is Prospero, who is a powerful figure in three ways. As a magician who can control spirits and forces of nature. As a ruler, although at the beginning of the play he has lost his power as Duke of Milan, he rules the island. And as a father. Prospero uses his power severely, as Caliban, Ariel and Ferdinand all learn. As Duke, he was too trusting and he's determined not to make the same mistake again. But sometimes he is hard on people to test them. Once he knows that Ferdinand rarely loves Miranda, his severity melts away. His tenderness towards his daughter Miranda shows a gentler side to his character. In the end, when he regains his rightful place as Duke, he is able to be merciful. Please note that in some modern productions of the play, Prospero has been cast as a female. Many of you might even watch the movie version of the play starring Helen Mirren. You are expected to follow the original Shakespearean text and to see Prospero as a male lead, a duke, not a duchess, a father, not a mother. Miranda knows hardly anything of the world beyond the island. To her, Ferdinand and the other people from the ship are more extraordinary and marvellous 
than Ariel and Prospero's other spirits are to the audience. She has the innocence of a romantic heroine, but she also has a tough and determined side to her character. When she tells Ferdinand, I'll be your servant whether you will or no, we know that she means what she says. A brave young romantic hero, Ferdinand willingly accepts slavery when it means he is near the beautiful Miranda. He is unaware of his father's part in the plot against Prospero, and so having none of Alonso's guilt, he doesn't share his gloomy side. His love for Miranda is consolation for all the trouble he suffers. As his name suggests, Ariel is a spirit of the air, one of the four elements which, according to the philosophy of the time, made up the universe and governed people's characters. The others are earth, fire and water. Everything about Ariel is light and mobile. He longs to be free like the wind. He is a mischievous spirit who cannot resist playing a joke on Caliban. But he knows where to draw the line and is careful not to provoke his master's anger. Caliban is the son of Sycorax, a woman banished from the North African city of Algiers for practicing sorcery or witchcraft. Caliban is a creature of the earth, the opposite of the air, the opposite of Ariel. It's possible that his name is an anagram of cannibal. Though he is surly and cannot take his position as Prospero's slave as lightly as Ariel does, there are some warm and sympathetic sides to his character. He obviously loves the island, both its natural riches and the strange supernatural music which the spirits make and he knows the island better than anyone. Like Miranda, he knows nothing of the world beyond and is overwhelmed with admiration when he meets someone from elsewhere. For us in South Africa, his character is of great significance as we grapple with the legacy of colonialism in our country. Alonso, the King of Naples, is a sad and guilty man. Even before he learns that he has landed on Prospero's island, he feels that the shipwreck and the death, or he thinks, of his son and heir are a punishment for his part in Antonio's conspiracy against Prospero. As the play proceeds, he becomes more and more helpless, sunk in grief and guilt. Nothing can raise him from despair until he learns that Prospero and Ferdinand are both alive and that he has the chance to make amends. Antonio is the brother of Prospero. His desire for power is ruthless, even planning to kill Alonso. He is cruel to others, such as Gonzalo, just for fun. Unlike Alonso, Antonio and his brother Sebastian feels no guilt at all for his misdeeds. At the end of the play, he does have a change of heart and asks Prospero for his forgiveness. Though a comical figure, an old man who talks endlessly, Gonzalo is still a very sympathetic character. He's an optimist who always sees the best in people and events. He saved Prospero's and Miranda's lives when they were banished, for which Prospero expressed his sincere gratitude when he met him on the island. Trinculo is Alonso's court jester. In Shakespearean plays, the audience would know to pay particular attention to what the jester says. 
under the guise of foolishness and clowning around, much wisdom is heard. As your final assessment is the writing of a literary essay on this play, it's vital that you make notes on the various themes that are found throughout the play. I suggest that you set aside a page per theme in your notebooks and keep adding information to those pages as you progress through the play. As with most plays and novels, you'll find these fairly generic themes in The Tempest. Freedom, betrayal, forgiveness, reconciliation, love, death, identity. These are found in almost all the works that we study. You should also be familiar with these themes from your study of earlier works in the junior grades, nature versus nurture, authority and power, appearance versus reality, disorder versus order, harmony, parents and children, brothers and sisters. In The Tempest, you'll also find these particular themes, particular to this play. Voyages, journeys of discovery, brave new worlds, colonialism, noble savagery, land, language and liberty, masters and slaves, rulers and subjects. For South African students, these take on an even greater significance as we use literature to understand our own positions in the complex country in which we live. The role of masters and slaves takes on another layer of meaning for those of us still living under the long dark shadow of the apartheid regime. By now you know that writers use key motifs and symbols to reinforce their themes. In The Tempest, you'll find plenty of references to these motifs and symbols. The island, ships, the sea, water, Prospero's staff, magic, music, books, and even chess. At the end of the play, when we see Miranda and Ferdinand playing a game of chess, we realize that every move has been plotted by Prospero with the care and attention paid to the board game by the Grand Masters of Chess. While there are many important quotations from the play that you will have to learn and embed in your written responses, I would like you to pause a moment on the three that appear on the following slides. This quote refers to a brave new world. It was used as the title of a science fiction novel by Aldous Huxley. What kind of a world are you living in? A brave new world, peopled with incredible characters with an element of magic about them? I hope so. When Caliban tells Prospero that you taught me language and my profit on it is I know how to curse it should resonate with all of you who are taught in a language that is not your mother tongue. You should think deeply about the role that language plays in your life, all languages. When the wedding of Prince Charles to Lady Diana Spencer was televised in 1981, I was thrilled to hear the priest quote these lines from The Tempest, that the wedding of a young girl to her prince was such stuff as dreams are made on. Little did we know 
that those dreams were more nightmares and the very public dissolution of that union continues today with echoes in the lives of Prince Harry and his American wife, Meghan Markle. This play has so much to say to us about our lives today. I hope that you thoroughly enjoy your study of this text and that you learn about yourself and the world in which you live as you do so. If you are serious about your English studies, I encourage you to read Margaret Atwood's novel, Hagseed. It's her retelling of Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And for those of you in grade 12 in 2022 to 2024, you'll be studying Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale. Get a head start on that by reading this novel first. You are encouraged to share this video introduction with all teachers and students of the play, as it's my firm belief that education and educational discourse can only flourish within a climate of generosity and allowing access to all without charge. Should you have any queries, please contact me on the email address that you see on the screen.